welcome to Royals, Rebels, and Romantics and my conversation with Nicola Clark about her amazing new book, The Waiting Game, the untold story of the women who serve the Tudor Queens. Can you imagine everything that these women saw and knew? I cannot wait to share my chat with Nicola with you. So sit back, enjoy, and think about sharing this episode with a friend because it's terrific. Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy to have you with me on another episode of Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. And I am thrilled to have with me today Nicola Clark, the author of The Waiting Game, the untold story of the women who served Tudor Queens. So welcome, Nicola. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Well, this is really exciting to get the behind the scenes. And I love this. We start right off. The book makes a big claim, the untold story. So we're going to learn things we didn't know before. But before we jump in, I just like to let us learn a little bit about you. What got you into history? What was your entree into history? Got you interested and into the tutors in particular, and then finally into this waiting group, this group of you know, people waiting on the Tudor Queens. So take us through that journey. Sure. Um, for me, it probably started as a kid. So um, my family, at least um, lots of them, are generally into history. I was dragged around castles as a child. We call it the rubble gene. You either have the rubble gene or you don't. I had it. My sister doesn't have it. So gradually, I started dragging my family around castles and stately homes, and it kind of switched in that way um but even as a kid i mean i don't know if this is the case in, in the us or anywhere other than england really but we study the tudors in primary school um so i was you know age i don't know 10 probably coloring in pictures of, of tudor women who were supposed to be henry's six wives and learning the whole divorce beheaded died divorce beheaded survived <laughs> rhyme um and around the same time not really relatedly, but it, it sort of was in my head. We were studying the Victorians and they had a big fascination with genealogy. So we made our own family trees and I got super into that. And after that, I used to make up family trees for fun because I was that kind of child. Um, and I feel like the kind of work I do now actually brings those two things together. Um, I can't remember dates and numbers to save my life, but I have an absurd memory for names and for connections which turns out to be really useful. Um, so I got into history, um, again, it was always there, but it was sort of by accident. So I uh, wanted to study literature, actually, that was my thing at school. Um, but when I went to university, I studied joint honours, literature and history, only because I couldn't somehow envisage history not being there. Um, and it turns out that, again, that was a good choice because over the course of the three years, I became gradually more historical and less literary. And I'd get feedback like the historian in you has responded well to this. Give the literature student a chance. Um, so it, it just seemed natural. There wasn't anything else that I immediately wanted to try and do uh, except for postgraduate study. And I'd spent my teenage years reading books about the Tudors going, but where are all the girls? And not just where are all the queens, but where are all the girls who were not queens? Um, so as a PhD student, I studied the women of the Howard family. So uh, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard's female relatives, basically. And as part of that, I wrote a chapter on those women as courtiers. And I realized as I was doing it that the context that I wanted to put them in just didn't really exist as a piece of research. So I thought, OK, well, next project is, is women in service at the Tudor court. And as I got into that research, I thought, hang on, this is not really a, a kind of pure academic project that will be read by 10 people I think quite a lot of people might be interested in this so I think I should maybe write it in a different way and here we are great and we are thrilled to have that for all of us even if we are not PhD candidates or whatever that we can have this project so tell me about finding the information about these women because they're not necessarily as prominently written about in their time as well as in our time. So what was the research like? Um, squiggly. 
that that's a weird word to use but it is the <laughs> right word to use um pretty much my first question i suppose when i started in on this topic was a pretty simple question who was a lady in waiting with these six wives and when um so really all i was initially trying to do was figure that out uh, and i it I found it really fast why no one had done a very kind of obvious names, numbers, stats, kind of biographical study on this material, um, because it, the archive just isn't super straightforward. So for uh, Elizabeth I's reign, for instance, there are lots of nice tidy lists of women who are in service at any given time, tons of them. We don't really have that for Henry's consorts. It just doesn't really exist in the same way. Um, we do have some lists. There are lists of things like who turned up to the coronation, who was at the funeral, who got a New Year's gift and, you know, things like this. But the names on the list always depend on the reason that the list was made. There is never kind of, or very rarely, one complete list of these are the women in ordinary daily service at this time, because there'd be no reason really to make a list like that. If it's a list of wages, then you're not going to list the people who are not being paid and they're not all necessarily paid if it's a list of who's showing up for a coronation again it's not going to, going to include any who for whatever reason were not there so you're always constantly reading between the lines um and it, it sounds mad to say that when you've spent enough time with the sources you are kind of going off vibes but it, it's well-informed vibes because you've spent so long looking at all these lists and all these women that you suddenly go oh actually she was pregnant then so she probably it but that's why and you start joining the dots in that way so yeah it's not straightforward to find them I went through all the kind of obvious lists I could and spreadsheeted them all um, and when some names did start to pop out more than others, that's when I would do a bit of a deep dive on an individual woman and start looking through indexes of legal records and things like that to see what I could find. Um, and I think when you're doing biographical research, you do end up getting very creative with the sources, because if you're looking for one person, you're going to use whatever you can find. So you then have to get quite good at, at using different sorts of sources correctly and sort of within their right context and not taking things out of context um if you're lucky there might be family records for a particular woman you do have to be lucky with that <laughs> but quite often in some kind of regional record office uh so for example for Catherine Willoughby Duchess of Suffolk there's some stuff in the Lincolnshire record office because her estates and where she lived when she's not at court is in Lincoln so they they ended up there um so you go wherever the stuff is at one point I went to Spain because again Spanish ladies in waiting came from Spain um yeah if I'd done a deep dive study on every single woman in my spreadsheets I think I would be there for the rest of my career <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's wonderful to hear about and I'm really glad you mentioned you know we had Catherine of Aragon coming over with a whole suite of Spanish women whose records were family records were in Spain. And so they could be in Spain, they could be in Lincoln, they could be all over because these women didn't live their whole lives in this moment of service. They have families elsewhere and they come from all kinds of places. So speaking of that, speaking of becoming or your family bringing you into or, or maybe how you go about getting a job, and we'll talk a little bit about what the job was, but um, the idea of getting your niece or your daughter or your granddaughter or whomever placed at court i i do wonder sometimes during the reign of henry the eighth he often used his wife's household as sort of his dating pool not always but there were he got more wives from households than any other single source so that was sort of a, a dating pool for him so by the time we get to Anne of Cleves. That didn't come from another, that was from a different source, but her household. And suddenly Catherine Howard is brought in by her family and placed in that household. I just wonder if you have a sense of at that point, were nobles like Thomas Howard, who wanted to maybe get ahead a little bit, trying to place female relatives or women they knew in households to possibly catch the king's eye? You know, I think that's a really tricky one. I think earlier on, 
I mean, maybe. But I also think that that narrative, particularly with Anne Boleyn, has, has been quite overdone and doesn't really reflect the sources. I don't think it's necessarily a good thing for a woman or for her family if she becomes the king's mistress, only because she doesn't necessarily get a lot out of it and then she becomes damaged goods and then what are you going to do? Right. Um, I mean, that happens to Bessie Blount, one of his very early mistresses. She gives him a son and she's still kind of meh. She does get married off, but it's not necessarily a better marriage than she might have managed otherwise. Uh, I also think that definitely by the time you're looking at, at Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard time, Henry's killed one wife, mm. another one died in childbirth. He put another one away and then she died. You know, his reputation is not stellar, really, as a husband. Um, and I think this this reputation as well is international. It's not just within England. One of the women that he was kind of potentially interested in in marrying was Christina the widowed Duchess of Milan. And she, I, we don't know whether she said this, it may be apocryphal, but she's supposed to have said, well, if I had a spare head, <laughs> then the King of England would be welcome to it. So it just shows, you know, this is not a man that people actually really want to marry by this point. Um, and I think the Duke of Norfolk has had one niece who's been executed as it is. Like, yes, he wants he wants representatives of the dynasty at court and in and around it for kind of, it keeps the family name in front of the monarch's eyes, eyes and ears in useful places, but you don't necessarily want him sleeping with them because you don't know where that might lead. And with Catherine Howard specifically at this point, the Duke of Norfolk probably didn't, or at least may not have known what she'd been getting up to before she went to court with men to whom she was not married. But other members of her family did know. So they did know that essentially she is that that horrible phrase damaged goods and so they know that if she catches the king's eye trouble might arise as um i mean it did so i don't think realistically people are are putting ladies in waiting in going oh go on sleep with the king you know i think it's an oh god really all right if we must OK, well, I appreciate that because I think that narrative is still out there. And so I did want to address that because we do have and and the Thomas Boleyn, it has largely been I don't want to say debunked, but it really has been taken on that. That's not what was happening. But I think that does still exist out there a little bit. On the other hand, to get a position at court in the Queen's household was so take the king out of it, but just to get a position at court in the queen's household could be helpful for a family. It is a very prestigious position. So who were the kinds of women who were selected for various, and, and give us any examples you'd like, but for various queen's households, what kinds of women were selected for those positions? The Queen's friends and the Queen's family, probably first off, when a new Queen consort comes in, she's going to want to reward the the women and the family who have been around her so far. Uh, family, because in theory, there's a support group right there. It doesn't always pan out in practice, but in theory, you can trust them. Uh, any women who have been your particular friends, you might want to keep some of the old guard around because one of the roles of ladies in waiting is is almost to build up this knowledge bank of how the court works, how ceremony works. When do you bow? And then we go left and then we wear this and, you know, stupid things like that. But somebody needs to know there isn't the kind of mistress of ceremonies type role officially. Uh, but the, the more experienced ladies in waiting take that on. So there's always a bit of an amalgamation of old and new. Um, if the Queen has been there for a little while and their vacancies come up, very often that's for the younger women who are the maids of honour. Um, and that's usually six. Adolescent women, I think we, we tend to think they're younger than they really were. They're usually around 16. Um, and for them, the court is almost like a finishing school kind of environment. They're there under the supervision of the mother of the maids. And they're there to gain some social polish, some contacts you know, to be pretty at important events and things like that, and hopefully make a good marriage. Um, but my God, competition for those places is insane. You need to almost know that one is likely to come up, which means you need contacts who are already in. 
Um, and somebody who tried incredibly hard to get one or both or however many daughters into service uh, was Honor Lady Lyle during the 1530s. So her family lives in Calais because her husband is the deputy of Calais, which means that they're not on scene. Mm. But they do have a London guy who does all their business for them. And she wants to get one of her two younger daughters into court service again, because if you're not in front of the monarch, then at least you can have a family member who is. That's not a bad thing. And this the letters that go back and forth. We have all these letters. It's very well. Mistress Parr's going to go get married. Oh, but her job's already been handed to this person. And oh, she's going to. Oh, no, she's keeping her job after she's married. Oh, but there's going to be a vacancy in about six months time on a full moon on a Thursday. It's very like that. Um, and then to get the job, they decide, right, we'll send both girls over. And we'll put them in the households of women who are already in the Queen's service, because then those women can take these girls into the Queen's presence, into her privy chamber. She'll see them. And then when there's a vacancy, they'll be at the top of her head. She might pick one. Uh, and that's that's pretty much what happens. But these girls arrive and their sponsors are very like, well, you're dressed all wrong. Here, borrow this. We'll make this. We'll write to her for this. And there, there we go. Voila, now you look apart. Take them into the privy chamber. Send the queen endless gifts. And uh, quails, Jane Seymour this is, and she's pregnant. She has a craving for very fat quails. There are many quails in Calais. So the family sends her quails. And while she's eating them, she's like, Lady Lyle sent these, didn't she? She's got daughters, hasn't she? What should we do? Shall we have one sort of thing? <laughs> and then both girls are paraded in front of her. And she actually chooses the younger daughter, mm. which I, I feel like if I was the older sister, I'd be a bit like, excuse me. <laughs> How did that happen? But the younger daughter is the careerist. She's ambitious and she's very sparkly and witty. And the older daughter is, um, I think, a bit quieter, probably nicer, but doesn't kind of shine in the same quite brash, courtly way as her younger sister. Okay, so so this is in Jane Seymour's time. So Jane, Seymour, Jane Seymour's number three, are there women who have served already either Anne or Catherine and still serving Jane Seymour. Do some of the women stay? And I'm thinking it's particularly interesting with Henry VIII because it's a somewhat dramatic change from wife number one to number two and then number two to number three. I mean, it's quite dramatic. So do does anyone carry on? Tell us about yes. that. Yes, I have not um not yet anyway found a woman who served all six wives there are rumors that this woman did or that woman did but i have not managed to track any of those all the way through the records i have found at least one woman who served five wives um and i write about her quite a lot in the book this is jane parker jane parker boleyn uh, viscountess rochford who was george boleyn's wife so anne boleyn's sister-in-law she uh, starts, I suppose, as a maid of honor. Maid of honor is a bit of a catch-all kind of useful term. It's used a lot. Um, it's very difficult to tell who technically is officially a maid of honor <laughs> and who is just a young woman who is also at court. But anyway, Jane Parker is at court in Catherine of Aragon's service. Because she's related to the Boleyns, she segues into Anne's service. Um, because, Well, possibly because she helps the investigation, even if she didn't necessarily quite intend to she survives Anne's fall and moves into Jane's service and she's gaining experience at this point um so she's she's very useful she knows how things work um which means that she's kept on for Anne of Cleves and then of course Catherine Howard again is a, a relative by marriage so she's there again but then she gets a little bit too close um starts helping the queen to see men who are not her husband um, and is executed alongside Catherine Howard in 1542. But up to that point, she was doing well. She served five out of six wives there. So yes, it was possible. It's not common, I think, would be fair. Well, it is interesting because you look at someone like Jane and things really change between Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn. And then things really change between Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour. So to get through those three, I would think really would take some... Um, 
great negotiation skills or some good political savvy or whatever it took. Um, but as you say, she becomes then very experienced and, and someone who can have that institutional knowledge in all kinds of ways. Maybe um, say, don't ever do this. This didn't go well for the previous women. All right. Well, so, you would think, I mean, you would think she would have said that, but right. to Catherine Howard and yes. yet somehow. <laughs> and yet, well, it, it is, <laughs> it is interesting. She had had a front row seat for what happened to Anne Boleyn, more than just a regular lady in waiting, because as a sister-in-law, she really had a front row seat. Her husband was caught up in it, and yet she is caught up in the Catherine Howard thing. So it is kind of surprising there. All right. So can you tell us, you've mentioned, okay, maid of honor is sort of a catch-all term. What are some of the different titles and responsibilities of these women who are at court? So in terms of titles, it would be nice if that was all neat and tidy and exact, wouldn't it? Of course, it, it's not necessarily. Um, so far as I can tell, and it's always so far as you can tell, because the different ranks that are given in different documents, again, if the documents are made for different reasons, they'll show different things. Household rank does more or less correspond to social rank, but it's not always completely exact. Um, but there tend to be usually about three ranks of women in the Queen's household. You've got um, earlier on, you've got the ladies who are the, the higher status women. You've got gentlewomen who are often the, the wives of knights and you've got chamberers and there's, there's fewer of those, but they tend to be slightly lower status and they tend to do the more menial jobs. So they'll keep keep the chambers clean or, you know, look after the jewels or do things that actually require some work. Um, and then, of course, you've got the maids of honour. A little, a little further into Henry's reign, it, it seems to diversify a little bit. And this might be because the privy chamber gets greater regulation as you go through Henry's reign. So now you've got, you know, women of the privy chamber and women of the presence chamber. And it's not quite clear what the difference is or whether it's always a distinction that's made. Um, but yeah, there tend to be slightly more ranks as you go further through Henry Swain, and that's greater social stratification as well. Um, in terms of what their roles are and what their job is, it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string sort of question. If you hold a position, um, what we call in ordinary service, uh, that means that you, you might be salaried, but it means that you're there pretty much full time, seven days a week maybe on a rota several months on several months off hard to tell the king's servants do have a rota like that so it's possible the queens do but there's no real evidence to, to make that super clear um you're not supposed to leave without permission uh, and really what you're there to do is to serve the queen in whatever way she requires so that might include personal service like helping her to get dressed and undressed that took elizabeth the first three hours in her day so that's a lot of, you know, close time with the Queen. Um, it might include care of her clothes and her jewels, keeping her chambers clean, also attending her wherever she goes, whatever she's doing. So that could be a banquet with foreign ambassadors. Um, it could be sharing her bed at night. Partly, I suppose, I suppose a little bit for security, but also they're there to act as chaperones as well as confidants. So you might be the queen's friend insofar as a queen can have a friend and know all her secrets but you're also there to make sure that if she does something dodgy she shouldn't do someone else knows about it and you know it, it's a weird line to walk are you on her side or not that sort of depends really what she's doing um any task that you do for the queen becomes something that holds a lot of honor even if it's quite a menial task so at Anne Boleyn's coronation for instance there are two countesses sort of at her feet and one's holding a bowl that she can wash her fingers in and one's holding a handkerchief that she can hold up in case the queen wants to you know spit or something and you'd think anyone else those would be incredibly demeaning tasks but but it's not they're countesses doing this and it's because it's done for the queen of England um so if you're going to be a female courtier, you need quite a diverse skill set, I would say. You need to be able to talk appropriately with a lot of different people, um, different genders and statuses and nationalities. So actually, if you can speak other languages, that that's not a bad thing. That won't go amiss. Um, you need to be able to dance. 
probably to sing, maybe play a musical instrument. You need to be able to hunt, so you're able to ride a horse. I mean, everyone can ride a horse, but like to ride a horse to hunt is faster and more dangerous. Um, and I think you probably need to be able to act to a degree, or would we say mask even? You've got to act like everything is fine, even if, frankly, you want to rip your corsets off and jump into bed. <laughs> um, I, th I think you've got to be able to stay up late and get up early repeatedly without showing that you're flagging. I think, I mean, to me, it sounds like a young woman's game. <laughs> it's not It's not a job I'd want to do. <laughs> so you mentioned one thing I, I think could be really interesting, like if the queen's doing something dodgy or if she's um, going out or whatever, the idea of loyalty and of mm -hmm. lack of loyalty, of, of almost spying on the queen, I think that those questions do come up in different reigns how much could the queen trust these women because even if they've been friends they could still be paid a whole lot of money by someone who's not a friend yeah i mean looking at it from a distance objectively and cynically she can't trust them okay Fun fundamentally okay um I, I think on the ground, it never looks quite that clear cut. Everybody's got to trust somebody. Uh, and and queens do, I think. Um, there are women who do stand up for the queen consort, you know, against the king or against somebody else. Um, that's particularly noticeable around Catherine of Aragon. She really seems to inspire loyalty in the people around her. Um, or it might just be because it is quite an unprecedented situation. Um, and it's the kind of circumstance that that forces people to make choices about loyalty that just hadn't ever existed as choices before and for women that's really difficult because you've taken an oath of service to the queen but the oath of service you take as a lady in waiting is actually to the king and to the queen and the king in theory trumps the queen but what do you do when the king and queen's interests diverge what are you supposed to do i mean you're supposed to go with the king but hang on you've served this woman for 15 years and you're just going to drop her that's that's tough and People made different choices. Uh, what about what your husband is doing? What about what your your dad and his family are doing, what they want you to do? Um, you're not really expected, I suppose, to make your own choices, but you're going to have your own opinions and, and what you want to do. Um, so, yeah, I think ladies in waiting are often being pulled in quite different directions and they're trying to find some kind of path through, some kind of path of survival through what is an increasingly difficult landscape. Right. And I think the example, and, and you do see a fascinating sort of transition or journey from the women who stuck with Catherine of Aragon. As you mentioned, she had some ladies who just stuck with her and were solid and angered the king and, you know, went with her. We're all team Catherine. And by the time we get to Catherine Howard, one of her ladies is actually executed with her. Yes. So that just reminds us of the danger. I mean, it's all fancy and fun when everything's great when you're at court, but it can be dangerous and turn so quickly. And to, to yeah. actually, you know, think about that. One of her ladies is executed with her. I mean, that's really yeah. pretty stunning when you think about it that way. I mean, killing the queen's pretty stunning right there. He, he makes some odd choices, but okay. Um, now let's talk about the difference between serving a queen consort, who is the mm -hmm. wife of the king, and serving the two queens regnant during the Tudor time. So you have the first two crowned regnant queens during the Tudor time. So what's the difference serving the consort and serving the queen to be honest in a day-to-day -day sense probably not a whole lot okay the duties more or less are going to be the same you're still helping the queen to get dressed and undressed you're still looking after her jewels you're still accompanying her whatever she's doing and wherever she's going and a lot of those things will still be very similar things you know the queen regnant meets with ambassadors as well um whether they I'm I would like to know actually whether they go with her to things like privy council meetings I don't have a 
the answer to that necessarily. I would imagine maybe one does because the queen is usually with at least one, probably two women. Again, as almost as chaperones, I suppose. Um, I think that, yeah, the role you play might be the same, but I think the perceived importance of your role is probably greater. I think you might be more in people's view and in people's minds because you represent access to the queen. And that's true of a queen consort as well. But when the queen herself is governing the whole realm, not just an accessory to the king governing the whole realm, then she's more important. So access to her is more important. So you, as somebody who uh, not necessarily controls that access, but has a role to play in that, you become more important as well. And your chances of affecting national policy, I think, are probably also a bit greater because you drop a word into a queen regnant's ear. Yes. Uh, she has more power than a queen consort. Um, these are all things that are quite difficult to sort of quantify with hard evidence, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that that would be my sense. Okay, and and so I want to follow up with another question because you you mentioned the idea of a chaperone. So queens don't just walk around by themselves. That's not no. what's going to happen. Mary is married. Mary the first is married. And when Philip is in the country, he could accompany her, right, as her husband. It seems to me it might be now. He does spend a lot of time out of England. So she is there on her own a, a good deal of the time as well. But as the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth has a different persona that she's projecting as well. So do you think she would be even more likely to have people with her women with her wherever she went because she does not have a husband. So it seems like the maybe need for a chaperone or need for a companion might be even greater with Elizabeth. Um, I think Elizabeth would have women with her wherever she went, but actually I think Mary would as well, unless she is, you know, literally in the bedchamber with Philip with their clothes off. <laughs> Um, which apparently was increasingly less likely as time went on. I think otherwise she also would have had women with her. I mean, I think even if we look at at the monarchy nowadays, you know, um, the late queen usually had at least one lady in waiting with her, whether or not her husband was there as well. So it's it's not only about chaperonage, but it's also, I suppose, about in modern terms you know I've lost a button I need a safety pin it's that kind of you know they're there to help fix your clothes and right what do you need I'll fetch it for you kind of kind of thing as well okay that makes sense and and when all those clothes are pinned together it seems like it's even more right. likely that this oh my sleeve's coming off kind yeah of thing. yeah probably not a safety <laughs> pin just yeah, yeah. yeah an actual pin <laughs> an actual person me back in kind of thing yeah <laughs> Now, as um, as the Tudor, I, I mean, the Tudor reign goes on. So we start with Elizabeth of York, the first queen consort and the um, the clothing. And I did just talk to Judith Arnup about the clothing, which has gotten dramatically different by the time yeah. we get to Elizabeth the first and some of those outfits we see. Is that also true of the way that the ladies closest to the queen? In other words, does their uh, what they're wearing reflect the monarch that they're serving or more oh it's always sort of standard for the position ah uh, yeah i mean there's an enduring myth isn't there that that Anne Boleyn refused to let anybody wear gable hoods or spanish fashion or whatever and and then jane seymour refused to let <laughs> people wear french clothes and things like that there's less truth to that than you might think um, there is some evidence that Jane Seymour says to uh, Anne Bassett, who's a new maid of honour, you know, wear out your French clothes first, but then after that, you need the gable hoods. And she does say that, that's true. But actually, in inventories of Jane's clothes after her death, and in uh, Mary, Princess Mary's clothes as well, they've got French hoods, they're wearing French hoods. It's not just gable hoods. So it's really not as clear cut as you might think. Um, there are trends that come in and out of fashion, Sometimes, yes, those are national things, you know, Spanish sleeves or uh, German sleeves and things like that. Um, and there might be some politics as to when you wear those and when you don't. That's hard to track through surviving records. Um, what else to do with 
clothes is important. I mean, lots of it. I was going to say something else and I lost my train of thought. Damn. All right. If I remember, All right. I'll say it. All right. <laughs> So there is a story about Elizabeth that someone wears a gown that she thought that she, the queen thought was above this woman's station. And then she was told never to wear it again. Or, or the exchange was something like, Oh, should I wear it? No, it's too big for you, your majesty. Well, then it's too big for you, meaning too grand. I don't, I mean, that's probably apocryphal. It's a fun story, but do we see certainly the queen is is sending messages is she dressing her women also to send messages about the magnificence of her court when a foreign ambassador would come do those ladies serve and I'm, i guess i'm specifically thinking about elizabeth because toward the end her stuff is so over the top would her ladies also be sort of blinged out to surround the queen with this message is oh my goodness the whole court is so wealthy we need to be trembling if we're visiting yeah. kind of thing Yes, I think that's fair. That's true earlier as well. Um, Catherine of Aragon and her women who go over to the field of cloth of gold in France. There's a lot of chat about um, how the French women are very elegant and very fashionable. And that's true uh, across the whole international stage. Actually, English women do have a reputation for their clothing being dowdy. We are not, as ever, we are not the, the fashion trend setters in early modern Europe that goes to the French. So, uh, ah, yes. So there may be a bit of trying to catch up or or make up for that reputation. Okay. Yeah, That's really... keeping up with the Joneses as well, you know. Yeah. Well, okay. All right. So if you are looking at um, the times where there was not a queen at court, so for example, during the reign of Edward the Sixth, or after Elizabeth of York dies, when there is not a queen. Do these women just go, what happens? And, and a couple of times in Henry VIII's reign, there are times he's between wives for, mm. you know, longer than a week. But what happens then to these households? Do we have these women still at court? Or if there's no queen to serve, are they gone? That really depends on who else is around. Are there other royal women? Okay. Because princesses have female households too. So uh, when Elizabeth of York dies in 1503, a lot of her women transfer into her daughter's service. So some of them go up with Princess Margaret to Scotland to marry James IV. Some of them stay quite a while, at least five years, uh, till she has a kid and then they come home. Um, a lot of them go into Princess Mary's service. And actually in that intervening period where there's no queen consort, uh, it's Mary, Princess Mary, who is the sort of de facto female royal household in lieu of a queen. Uh, until Catherine of Aragon comes along in 1509. Um, that's not always the case. I mean, between Catherine Howard and Catherine Parr, there's a gap. Princess Mary, um, by that point, is old enough to have a household and kind of act the part of a queen. She's also in favour at that point, so she right. spends quite a lot of time at court. And her privy purse expenses survive, and they're full of, of women seeking favors so she's kind of um doling out patronage almost as though she were the queen so sometimes there is a a household that acts the part of a queen's household without really being one where that's not the case so when jane seymour dies her household is officially broken up and officially dismissed so yes the women are sent home um there might well still be women in and around court because there are women whose husbands are in service with the king and they are entitled to lodge with them. So there may still be women around the court, but they're not gathered around a queen consort. There are still some slightly odd occasional gatherings of ladies in waiting. Um, my impression is that women might be summoned to court when there's an event that warrants it. So even if there's not a queen, if you've got some kind of big embassy or something where you need women to dance with, don't you? So quick, get them in. Um, and there's, there's a slightly odd occasion in August 1539, about six months before Anne of Cleves arrives, there's a gathering of, I suppose, former and then future ladies in waiting in Plymouth to view the king's ships, to view the fleet. And they all write him a collective thank you note and they sign it. Um, and a lot of those women are the wives of men in the king's service. So possibly they are still kicking around, um, but not all of them. And it's not quite clear 
is Henry trying to create some kind of semblance of normality by by gathering women together? He's not even there, though. So uh, it does show that there are still women around. Women still gather almost as ladies in waiting, even if there isn't a king. Um, yeah, queen. Sorry. Um, under Edward the Sixth, it's harder to tell. I think sometimes there's a bit of a quasi court um, around Protector Somerset's wife and Stanhope. Um, Duchess of Somerset. I also think that there's a lot of aristocratic women living in their London homes during that time, just to kind of be geographically convenient in case they are acquired. So I think there are usually women around, even if there isn't a queen's household. Oh, that's great. I like that geographically convenient in case, <laughs> because there was always a chance that Edward would suddenly decide to get married. Um, that certainly was discussed. And Mary and Elizabeth are both sort of in mm. and out and around the court and in and out of favor there too. Of course, then Jane Grey as well. So there, there are a lot of key, key women in the game. All right. So of this whole sort of sweep of Tudor women and the women serving Tudor queens, are there moments that you just really were surprised by? Either the women surprised you or what happened surprised you or something, you know, someone's behavior, good or bad, you oh. know. Um, did anything surprise you as you were doing your research and sort of digging into the records that you could find and putting them together? Yes. Uh, and again, it's it's a Spanish girl, it's Maria de Salinas. Um, in the limbo period, after Catherine of Aragon is widowed, Prince Arthur's dead, and she's waiting around, hopefully to marry the future Henry VIII. But it's on the table, it's off the table. Dad-in-law and dad are arguing about money and Catherine's stuck in the middle. Her Spanish women are stuck there with her. Um, and we tend to think about and Maria in particular, because she's there for a long time, but but all of Catherine's Spanish women as this kind of sisterhood, loyal sisterhood. You know, they love her, they support her. That might be true later. It's not true then. Maria, desperate to get out, go home, leave this hellhole. <laughs> she hates England. Um, as part of the research I, I came across, I hate to say I found, because, you know, they weren't lost. They were filed neatly in an archive. We just didn't know they were there. Um, came across some letters that Maria wrote home to her Spanish family. And in it, she says at one point, uh, this is not a country to stop in unless necessary. Um, does not like England. And and it, it's fair enough, you know, they're stuck there. Service to a queen is supposed to bring you all kind of perks and they're getting none of them. Um, so yeah, lots of them are desperate to leave, desperate to get out. That surprised me because I had swallowed the general narrative of, you know, they're there to support her and they love her. That's true later. It's not true then. Um, I guess, yeah, that was probably my biggest surprise, perhaps. Yeah, I, I will have to say that that is a surprise because we have this image of Catherine being so beloved and having such loyal women but as you say, in that moment, all your reasons for being in service have kind of disappeared after Arthur died. And, yeah. and they weren't even, she wasn't even able to pay her household for much of that time. So, Absolutely. And to be honest, she's also a bit of a nightmare to serve, I think, at that time. Again, we have this image of Catherine being this serene, pious, beloved lady. And again, that's not untrue, but actually during that time where she's still you know, late teens, early 20s, I suppose. She uh, is panicking, understandably. She's she's in a constant state of massive anxiety. She um, throws her loyalty at particular individuals that she shouldn't. She makes bad judgment calls and then doubles down a lot. Um, and it doesn't always go well for the people who are around her. I think it must have been quite exhausting at times. Right. And she certainly grows up and later makes a lot of really wise decisions. But in this moment, she's uh, desperate for anyone yeah. who really, you know, listen to her. So she she does. She chooses a lot of the wrong men to trust yeah. and um, and it, that it would affect her household as well. Well, that's great because it, again, reminds us how difficult that time was for her. I think we forget that she ends up being married to Henry and then we go on to the next difficult time with Anne Boleyn. 
but that wasn't the first difficult time. There's that whole seven years where, yeah, that would be difficult. So those women, again, are real women. They're not just ciphers serving the queen. These are women who want to get on with their own lives too, most likely, and get out of England and back home and, and make their own way. So, all right. So in addition to the thing that surprised you, if if you could have your readers remember one thing about these women, what one thing do you want to make sure we take away from this book? Because we've not, you know, seen the women or focused on these women, the untold story, right? So what one thing do you think is really important for us to take away? I think that while they are a group with a unique perspective on all of these events, they're also individuals who have lives outside of the Royal Court and outside of Royal Service. And actually those things interact a lot of the time. So just because you're in service doesn't actually mean that you are permanently glued to the Queen's side. You've got other things going on and you've got other concerns and sometimes they might conflict with things that other people around you want. Um, so I think, yeah, the way that those different concerns interweave or conflict and the, the many demands on these women, I think, and the choices that they therefore have to make. Right. And there's, there is something that is not that far from our lives as you have your work life and then your personal life and you're trying to balance them and take care of various family members, but your boss, who's the king and queen, want something and want you to travel and it's not a convenient time for my family. All those kinds of things are really not as far removed from us. So I appreciate that. All right. Now I always like to ask what you're working on next and where we can find you and follow you. Uh, you can find me and follow me mostly on Twitter. Okay. Um, at Nikki Clark eight, six. Um, that is my, yeah, major social media kind of platform I suppose uh what am I working on next I'm hoping to do some more work on uh, Maria de Salinas and her letters and her her life in Spain and then in England um yeah TBC we'll see okay um I would also like to do some work on some of the people around Elizabeth the first so some of her family members and and people like that that's yeah well, we'll see how that goes. That that might be something that comes up next. All right. Well, we will watch for that. And I will have the social media link. So don't worry about that. And again, the book and it's just out. Uh, no, not yet. 25th of April. 25th of April. All right. <laughs> 25th of April. And that's in the UK. Do you have a US date? I do not have one at the moment. Okay. All right. Well, if we have it by the time the episode goes live, we'll include that as well. Sure. So it's, I love this title too, The Waiting Game. I just love that. <laughs> Waiting Game, the untold story of the women who served the Tudor Queens. Thank you so much, Nicola, for being with us and for taking us into these women's lives and giving us a really great perspective. I mean, these women saw it all and it's really amazing to think about them. Um, throughout this tumultuous reign. So thank you so much for being with us. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. I want to give a big shout out to my wonderful patrons who make all of this happen. If I could ask a big favor, if you would consider subscribing or sharing with a friend, leaving a rating or a comment, it really means so much. Again, thank you for joining me and let's keep shaking up history together.